Nothing twinkles quite as bright as a classic Hollywood star, and few were ever bigger in their day than Lana Turner. Of course, there's Lana Turner the legend, and Lana Turner the wife and mother. In her oversized collection of family photos and personal anecdotes, Lana, the memories, the myths, the movies, Turner's daughter, Cheryl Crane, pulls back the curtain and offers a fascinating peek at a life well-lived. This is Cheryl's second turn at telling us about life in the Turner household. In her first book, Detour, a Hollywood story, she wrote about her own life, from the controversial death, excuse me, from the controversial death of Johnny Stampinato to coming out as gay and how it changed her relationship with her mom. Um, Cheryl, welcome to Mr. Media. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very good. Well, thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I think I pushed the button at the wrong time a minute ago, and everyone may have heard me clear my throat, so I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have the magic buttons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I had the magic touch. Hey, <laughs> Cheryl, this is, a, this is a beautiful book that uh, you and uh, Cindy, Cindy uh, De, La, De La Hose, uh, and I hope I say that somewhat correctly. De La Hose. Uh, De La Hose. I'm, Cindy, I'm sorry. Um, I, and I know I'm not the key market for... Uh, a collection of photos and stories like this, but I mean, you, you, you'd have to be an idiot to be unimpressed by the quality of the photos and the, and the, and the color of the stories, frankly. Well, we've, we're very, very proud of it, and the reviews that we have gotten have just been, well, it's knocked me over. Uh, Leonard Malton said it was the best movie star book ever written, and Robert oh. Osborne uh, said that no one had ever done a tribute like this so i mean i'm in awe of the of what people are thinking about it i i was hoping it would be good but i think that they really really gone for it <laughs> <laughs> what inspired you to to take this approach uh and i should describe for a second it's a it's a big oversized coffee table type book it's got this uh uh, very glamorous photo of uh, your mom, Lana Turner, on the front, and it's just packed with photos. But there's also just a tremendous uh, treasure trove of, of stories. Uh, what, why did well, what inspired you to do this? Before I answer that, just to describe it a little further, it is it's sure. 400 pages. It weighs over five pounds. The cover photo is hand tinted by a dear friend of mine, Tom Marutis, in. Australia. So we had help all over the world with this book. The reason I wanted to do it really was that I had all these thousands of photographs. I wanted to do something with them, um, and I had wonderful stories to go along with them. But you know what it's like. You need the right person that has the skill and the organizational abilities to put it together, and that was Cindy. And she had done two books, uh, one on Marilyn Monroe, uh, Platinum Fox, and another one on Lucille Ball, Lucy at the Movies. And she contacted me, actually, and said, would I be interested in doing a coffee table book? And she had sent me her two books, and I said, would I? This is what I've been looking for. And that's where it started. Um, so, by the sheer number of uh, photos you say you have, is it is it likely there'll be another one, or is this the? Uh... Oh, we have we have enough photos for two more books. I don't know that I have the stories, but we've got. <laughs> we well, were I, I want... we were supposed to be three hundred and fifty pages, and our editor kept saying, "Well, you can't not use this one, and you can't not use." Well, we were finally up to four forty, and they said, "No, no, no, no." Go back. We've got to cut 400. It is so. That's what we ended up with. I'm I'm interested in the stories particularly, um, and because I wondered how do you collect that many uh, stories? Do, it's not like you you know as you're growing up and and you know you you mature well, and, and you you from, might... They came from from two specific people. My grandmother who was there through almost every minute of it, and my mother herself in the last four years of her life. Um, we started talking about stories in the past when I was doing Detour. Now, that's yeah. 20 years ago. 
um, Guitar published in 88. So a lot happened from 88 to 95 when my mother passed away. And we were able to spend really the last four years of her life with her quite a bit of the time. And we just, as we say in Hawaii, talk story, you know. Mm. And uh, she was wonderful with her her wealth of, of knowledge, memory. I mean, her memory was exquisite. And she was always saying to me, get it right. <laughs> you know, if you're going to tell <laughs> the story, get it right. And we just, you know, we just sit around and have fun and talk. So that's where so much of it came from. And again, my grandmother, who as a child growing up would tell me stories about my mother and the times that they had. Hmm. How, how much, uh, how, how many of the stories came from before that uh, time? I mean, would you look at these photos as you're going through them and go, oh, I remember where we were and... Yes, there was a lot of that. Cindy came, I'm, I live in Palm Springs, and Cindy came out here from Philadelphia, spent about eight weeks here, um, and we would, uh, first we started going through all the photographs and putting them in order of where where they were, what they were, and then we just started from the beginning with old family photos and just started talking. And I would tell her stories and she'd record it and then, i go to sleep, and she'd go home and type. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's sort of how we, thank God she's only 25. She had the energy. Wow. Well, let's, let's uh, uh, talk about some of the, uh, what I consider to be the best stories in the book. Okay. Uh, you, have to start, you have to start a discussion like this, though, um, between, you, maybe you can define the difference between the legendary story of Lana Turner being discovered at Schwab's uh, soda fountain and where the truth actually lies. I thought that was interesting well, that's, to read. See, that's, one of, that's one of the myths that we tried to um, straighten out. Uh, she was discovered a uh, catty corner across the street from Hollywood High School uh, in a little cafe called the Top Hat Cafe. It's been gone for years. But Schwab's Drugstore had a PR man who was brilliant and grabbed onto the story and moved it to Schwab's. And Mother used to say that Schwab's really should have given her stock in the company. <laughs> and many a young lady sat at the bar, at the you know soda fountain bar and said, "Is this where Lana sat?" And of course, she hadn't sat there at all. Was anyone actually discovered at Schwab's over the years? Did you? You know, I had no idea, but that story has sure persisted. <laughs> and no matter how many times you correct it, I'm sure it will continue. Well, it's just... it will always be Schwab's. You know, that, that's the magic of Hollywood. Uh, they have their own, they write their own endings. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, uh, at the beginning of the book, um, and I'm, I'm, op I'm opening the book up now as we're talking because, uh, well, frankly, I just can't resist this series of photos. Uh, it's page 28. Uh, People want to play along at home. Uh, you you have the you have the series of photos I that get made her. my copy. If you're gonna come on, that. come on, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, no, wait a minute. Let me get it. All okay, right. so you want to go to page twenty-eight. Page twenty-eight. I won't do this to you often in the conversation, but that's all um, right. I'll be prepared. <laughs> all right. This is uh, you, it's titled "The Walk They Won't Forget," and this is basically your mother yeah. walking down the street. And lots of people walk down lots of streets, but uh, I guess on film, especially uh, you know, early in the Hollywood uh, age, uh, this is the first time they saw a, a young woman looking like your mother did in a sweater. And I mean, she became the sweater girl. I mean, yeah. if you've never seen the movie, they won't forget you will instantly understand, I certainly a, a, a man will anyway, why Lana Turner took off in the movies. Well, she, she bounced a bit. <laughs> <as you say. laughs> and I don't think that would ever have. They remember this was 1937. And she had a magnificent walk, which she was known for uh, throughout her career. Um, John Waters, who I'm sure you know who he is, the director sure. is, dear friend of mine, and he did a series of photographs of her leaving the room of, of, of diff various movies because he said her leaving the room was as good as her entering the room. <laughs> so I think he picked up on that walk, too. 
Well, and there was something that you said about this um, uh, that you know she was um, you know she was a young girl. She was still in her teens at the time, she and was, was seventeen. Yeah, and that uh, you know she was just being herself. And you know it's interesting. I I coach uh, uh, girls soccer, and and I, I'm I'm starting to understand this now. Almost fifty years old, I'm starting to understand a little bit about this. As a as a boy at that age, I thought girls were all aware of how they came across when they walked through the room. You know, they're they're young and they're they're Mm-mm. beginning to be <laughs> curvaceous. And my wife straightened me out on this, and I'm starting to get it now. She said they don't. They, they don't know. They, it's not like it's planted in their brain. You walk this way or you look this way. This is how you're perceived. They're just being themselves. And you described that pretty well here. I thought that was very interesting. Well, when, when she had never seen, you know, how many of us actually see ourselves on the screen as others see us? You know, even looking in the mirror, you're looking at an object in the mirror in reverse. Mm-hmm. So you don't even really see yourself looking in a mirror. So when you see something of of yourself on the screen, it's got to be a total shock to you. And particularly, again, I'm reiterating this was the 1930s. (laughs) You know, today things are a lot different, but then to have to see yourself on the screen walking like that, I mean, she was, she was very funny about it. I mean, she wanted to crawl under the under the seat. You know, I mean, it was, took a while for her to get over that. It was, yeah, I mean, it was it was an amazing image. But I, I was very interested in the way you presented her res- response to that. I, it was very interesting to read. Um, did did that evolve though with her? I mean, there there did come a point where. She knew that she was seen as, you know, very sexual and, I, I and, and sexy. I knew she was, but I don't believe that she ever really understood it. She used to say, I am a very sensual woman mm-hmm. in, in all aspects of life. But she never considered herself sexy. Uh, she never could understand why she was considered a pinup during the war years. Um, It it is very difficult for one to really see oneself (laughs) as others perceive you. And uh, we used to watch old movies together of hers and and other people too, but particularly of hers. And she was a constant running uh, critique of herself throughout the movie. I mean, it, it was funny and fun, but it was, you know, you didn't really see much of the movie. <laughs> but she knew she was good looking. She knew that the camera loved her. I mean, you can see it, and I don't think she ever took a bad picture. Um, mm. Going through the book, you can see her evolve, uh, try out new. You know, they talk about Madonna reinventing herself. I think Mother did that years ago. You know, I mean, you see her go through every hairstyle, every hair color, uh, every mode of makeup, dress, um, and constantly evolved um, into a new being so that she looks different in almost every photograph you see. Mm. She did uh, so many uh, uh, memorable movies, and it was with so many... Uh, opposite so many great male actors. I saw, I think, the four they, movies they, with Clark Gable. Her, all of them, yes. She, yeah. Clark Gable, um, Robert Taylor, Spencer Tracy. I mean, all of the top, top leading men she played opposite at one point or another. Uh, she always considered um, Clark Gable as, as one of her her greatest leading men. She respected him so much. Um, They had a wonderful working relationship. Um, And again, this was a man that liked to have a good time. And Mm. so did Mother. You know, they loved the practical jokes. They were always... You'll see some photographs in there, like with Ephraim Zimbos Jr., where they're cracking each other up on the set. You know, I mean... This is what went on behind the scenes. And this was really what I, I wanted to show this woman that loved life, loved the joke, loved to laugh. 
And people don't see that when they just look at her as the movie star, which, of course, she was. But she was so much more than that. Mm. She, uh, <clears throat> she, she, and I'm sorry, I'm clearing my throat a lot today. Just, uh, um, she uh, uh, had, she was married many times. She, she had, I mean, you're, you, you know, you're very straightforward about this in the book. Married many times. She uh, certainly uh, dated uh, a number of uh, co-stars. Um, did she, did she find happy, more happiness uh, with, with uh, men outside of the business, or were, it didn't seem like there were that many. I mean, your 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 own father was in the business at the time, although he made his well, career outside. Well, he was trying to be, but thank goodness yeah. he found the restaurant business, or we would have starved. Uh, <laughs> oh, truly, um, I have seen his two films. <laughs> There's a lot to chuckle about. Um, I think that one of Mother's happiest marriages was with Fred May, who certainly was not in the business. He was in real estate and uh, breeding and raising racehorses. Um, it was a marriage. They remained friends until Fred passed away, which was right before Mother passed away, actually. But um, they... She often said she didn't know why she ever ended the marriage. I mean, it was because they really were had a good time together. Um, she was only, I mean, she dated uh, certainly and had romances with a lot of people in the business. Um, but they weren't always the happiest of times. Is it, I... Uh... I can't imagine uh, – now, I write books for a living. I, I, I probably do what, what Cindy does, work with people and help them tell their stories. And I, the thing that strikes me is I can't imagine going back and telling stories about my mother or my father's uh, romantic life. It just uh, – <laughs> you know, I don't know. It just, it just seems like uh, ant, ant, antithetical to something that I would be ever comfortable with. How do you, well, get, I, how do you get to do that? I think that the difference – is that I lived through them with her, mm-hmm. um, and to me, that's the way life was. You know, it, it's when you're older, looking back, um, you probably had parents that uh, were only married once and had their kids and, and, you know, stayed together, or maybe not, but I'm sure <laughs> you didn't have parents that had, between them, 14 marriages, you know. <laughs> okay, no. My, Father no. <laughs> dated, dated and married a lot too, uh, but that was the norm in my life from the time I was born. You know, my father wasn't even with my mother uh, by the time I have cognizant recognition of him. They were divorced, mm-hmm. and the earliest person I really kind of remember a mother being with um, was. Tyrone Power when I was about three, but so I mean I, I didn't grow up having a mother and father together in the house. I had a lot of stepfathers, some good, some bad. <laughs> right. um, but so you know, for me to tell the stories, this, those are the stories of how I grew up. Yeah, yeah and, and that's a, I, that does come across. It. I mean, you're a part of these stories. Um, Again, for the good, for the bad. You know, it wasn't always, <clears throat> from reading it, it wasn't always a great situation for you, but that was your life. No, but it was a very privileged. I, I had an extraordinary childhood. Um, the best of everything and some of the worst of everything, but I was always knew that I was loved by my family. I'm taking everybody in there. Um, and I was always knew I had them behind me. So all of us have bad times. I'm sure you did in your life, your wife does, your listeners do. I mean, everybody has bad times, and and that's just what makes life life. It's how you get through them, I think, that makes the difference between all of us. 
I agree. Well, um, if you've got a question for author Cheryl Crane, whose new book, uh, Lana, The Memories, The Myths, The Movies, is a collection of rare photos and anecdotes about her mother, Lana Turner, give us a call, 646-595-3135. The the Lana Turner, uh, Frank Sinatra, Eva Gardner sort of triangle is an interesting one. Uh, You you write that, of course, everyone knows that the, the Frank Sinatra Eva Gardner back and forth over the years, but you write that uh, your mom and Frank definitely were an item, even though it was out of the public purview. Absolutely, and and I I've often wondered. Um, I asked Mother once why she never acknowledged this ongoing off, off again on again romance um, friendship. Really, it was a friendship that had moments of romance. I think that would be the the most correct way to describe it. Um, Her answer was, well, it was his family. And by that, I think she meant Nancy Sr., really, um, and the kids. Um, Their feelings toward each other were very, very private. And Mm. ongoing, he was always uh, in our life. Um, but it, they would get together from now and then, you know. It, it just, <laughs> if it was the right time and the right place, you know, um, they would have a little romance. And this went on for years and years and years. And, and but I think we all in our family looked at him more as a, a wonderful. Um, well, I called him Uncle Frank, but I mean, it, he was he was part of our family. So that's, you know, I try and describe that in the book and how much he meant to us and, and how much their friendship meant to each other. Mm-hmm. Was there a, a, a moment you can think of where Frank Sinatra was just a, a guy calling on your, on your mom as opposed to Frank Sinatra calling on, on your mom? No, because I wasn't really, a, I mean, he would be at the house um, visiting on and off uh, throughout my lifetime. He was always there when we were in trouble. I mean, he was the first one that would show up. Um, he was always sending gifts, but that he did that. That was how he was. But when they were when they would be off together, it would be New York or Vegas or Europe or you know that kind of thing where I wasn't there. Got it. It was Frank Sinatra being Frank Sinatra, I suspect. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, another story that I loved was uh, the one about your grandmother hemming Howard Hughes's pants. <laughs> oh my God! Yes. And and before before you holes in the phrase <laughs> pants on the bottom. Oh God! This it's so funny because my grandmother adored him, mm. and he probably spent more time with my grandmother, all in all waiting for my mother to get ready than he did with my mother. Um, They had a series of dates, uh, uh, a romance, but his mother used to say she wasn't going to end up being locked up somewhere (laughs) on a hill (laughs) like poor Jean Peters. So that, you know, um, my mother liked her freedom. But here again is a man that was, when you needed something, he was there. Mm. And um, when my mother had a miscarriage with with, um, Bob Topping, her third husband, um, um, Howard flew the plane that got my grandmother back east to get to her. So, you know, things like that. Um, Yeah, you're underselling, listen, you're underselling that story. (laughs) (laughs) Because... Because that was that was a tremendous. Uh, and, uh, let me go back a second. Uh, yes. For younger people who may be listening to this, who are going, Howard Hughes? Why is that a big deal? Who's that? Well, yeah, it would well, be the, the. Yeah, I mean, it would be the equivalent today of uh, if Bill Gates was coming to to call on your on your mother. Uh, <laughs> you're basically, the richest man in the world, and you know he's coming, and and so we have the hemming of the pants story. But well, oh, that, uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, I got off of that. My. This was a man who really, for all his wealth um, and fame, didn't care how he looked. 
you know, and he would wear the same clothes, and hopefully they were clean. I don't remember this, but, um, you know, I mean, he he literally had would wear pants until they frayed at the bottom. And my grandmother, who really liked him very, very much and found him to be an extraordinarily intelligent man, which always impressed her, um, thought that he might have better luck with his mother if he looked a little better. <laughs> so she was always trying to spiff him up somewhat, you know. And, uh, yes, he, she did him his pants. <laughs> And so to come back to the story about him flying the plane, um, and, and this is page uh, 132, again, for those playing the game at home. Um, you're, uh, okay, she, your mother was... Uh, My mother was married. Uh, oh, she had the miscarriage, right. She had a miscarriage in 1949. Right. She was married to Bob Topping, who owned, with his brother Dan Topping, the Yankees, which was another extraordinary thing to be able to go and sit in the owner's box at the Yankees. Mm -hmm. So it, I remember that, too. And that's when the Yankees were really the Yankees. So uh, she had a miscarriage. Uh, Howard Hughes owned TWA, which would be like owning United Airlines today. I mean, TWA no longer exists, but... In its time, it was the biggest, it was Trans World Airlines. It was the biggest airlines in the world and the one that everybody flew, particularly anyone from Hollywood. And my mother, who was back east in Connecticut, suffered a miscarriage. Now, in those days, we used to go back east to visit her by train, which is a three-day ordeal. I loved it, but an ordeal for the adults. And... He, when when my mother called my grandmother and said, come, I need you, um, Gran called Howard and said, I've got to get to my daughter as fast as possible. He said, I will put you on a plane right away, meet at the airport. Well, Gran didn't know that Howard was flying the plane himself. <laughs> And this was a commercial airliner, okay? This was, I mean, there were other passengers. It wasn't a private plane. But he wanted to make sure she got there safely and on time, so he kicked the pilot off and said, I'm flying. So, <laughs> you know, they did things like that in those days. Right. And he Just... flew the plane and came out. When they landed in New York, he came out and said, Mildred, I have a car waiting for you. You know, <laughs> off she went. It's just such a great story. I mean, it, it's it's not actually a Hollywood story so much as it's just this crazy industrialist story, but it had such a great ending where, you know, he, he arranged the plane and <laughs> he comes well, out and I he love it. it. Because I, I've flown so much, and can you imagine, you know, you're, you land in a plane and here comes the owner of the plane that owns the whole thing coming out and had flown you there. I mean, had to have blown her away. Well, and, and again, the the modern day equivalent would be if uh, you've got a problem with Windows on your computer, and you pick up the phone, and Bill Gates flies to your house. Oh, I and, love it! Yes, he comes uh, out and fixes. <laughs> I mean, oh, I only yeah. wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill, if you're listening, Cheryl apparently could use some help with her mm -hmm. with her computer. Um, <laughs> have you seen all of your mother's movies at this point? Uh, actually, there's a couple I've missed, but. They were ones that I'll get around to <laughs> one of these <laughs> days. I've seen them in order from They Won't Forget all the way up to the last couple of ones she did, which I haven't seen, I'm ashamed to say. Understood. Uh, is it, uh, I mean, how does it feel to watch it, especially now, you know, unfortunately she's, she's not with us anymore. It's been a few years. Well, now but I, have, I had to watch some of these in doing the book because mm -hmm. not only to refresh my memory but to particularly a couple that I hadn't seen I had to watch it was very difficult the one that I still can't watch is Imitation of Life because I start crying at the credits and I think it's because I know that scene is going to come where Annie dies 
and you know the funeral scene. I I just and Annie is not my mother. Annie is uh, Juanita Moore, who plays uh, opposite my mother in it as her dear friend and and companion and housekeeper. Mm. And I know that's coming when I see the credits. So that's going to take me a while. <laughs> that would be tough. I mean, I've I've talked to. Uh, uh, actors and actresses who have children and ask them, you know, in the movies where they die, I mean, how do your kids deal with that? Oh, they just try not to even let their kids see those movies. Well, see, it's one just... of the first movies that I, and one of my, my favorite, favorite movies is, and I don't know that this is in the book really, but uh, in, is Zigfield Girl. Now, hmm. Zigfield Girl originally ended with her fall down the stairs and the assumption that she dies. They had, they had such bad audience reaction to that that they had to shoot an additional scene with uh, Jimmy Stewart where they talk about the fuzzy little yellow ducks. <laughs> and you get the impression that she may die, but she may not, and they may go on and have a life where they raise fuzzy little yellow ducks. So this <laughs> fuzzy little yellow duck thing became in our household. Um, Any time there was any kind of a argument going on between my mother and I, or my grandmother and my mother, or you know, which happens in you know, you particularly as teenagers, sure. you argue a lot. Sure. What would always break the ice? was something to do with fuzzy little yellow ducks. <laughs> so whether it was a card with a duck on it or a, a, a little china ornament that was a duck, I mean, that was our way of breaking the ice and saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a movie. <laughs> as wow. silly as that is. Jeez. Do you have, uh, uh, beyond that, I mean, do you have uh, some favorites among the movies that you could watch over and over again? Oh, well, Zigfield Girl, Always, The Bad and the Beautiful, which I think she gave, definitely gave an Academy Award performance for that. Didn't get it, but she should have. Um, I love some of the odder ones. I love Flame in the Flesh. Hmm. Where she's brunette. It's such a strange movie. It's Lily Tomlin's favorite movie. Um, not many people have seen it. It was filmed in Italy. But I find it interesting because she plays such a different character in it. Um, I like her movies where she's stretching her her acting um, mm -hmm. and, and playing something so different from who, who she really is, you know? Um, I mean, I love Diane. That was one of my favorites. I liked the costume movie. She didn't, but... Um, I think she didn't because she was so uncomfortable in the costumes, but I always enjoyed those. Uh, Three Musketeers and Diane and, and Green Dolphin Street, those are all several costume, heavy costume epics. Any that you can't stand? Oh, uh, these boys. That's a terrible question. I'm sorry, but that, I'm just well, curious. There's, there's, some of the, there's some that I don't feel were that great. Um, her, the one she hated, and I'm sure people would be much more interested in what she couldn't stand than me, okay. was Mr. Imperium, which was with Ezio Pinzo. Pinzo. Hmm. Ezio Pinzo, the opera singer. Right, she, right. This, he, he he always ate raw garlic for lunch, and then they'd have a <laughs> romantic scene. <laughs> Not happy with that movie. Hated that movie. Got it. Uh, you you write in the book that, uh, and I, I, I'm sure this is very common in Hollywood, that there were a lot of times where there were movies that she really wanted to, to make or be part of, and if they didn't pan out for one reason or another, you, yeah. you actually have a whole section about that. Uh, that's, uh, well, I, that I, I guess that's a common thing. I, I think it goes on today. I mean, you you either read a book or a script that you fall in love with and you want to do it, and for some reason, they, well, a good example uh, of a tiny little book called Forever by Mildred Cram. Um, 
my mother owned the option on that for years. She wanted to do that so badly. She wanted to do it with Tyrone Power. Then hmm. as she got older, and she kept renewing the option, then she just wanted to see it get made by anybody, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it just never did. So I think that goes on a lot. You have, you have, it has to be the right timing. You have to have the producer, the director, the studio, the actors. You know, it all has to fall into place. Are there? Uh... I'm sure many of us have have uh, your you your listeners, many people who have read a book. Um, or an article or something, and say, wow, this would, I wish they'd make a movie of this. It would be so great. And has favorites like that, and they never get done. And then mm-hmm. there's some you wonder why they got done. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. Yeah, uh, Cheryl, on the personal side, I wondered if you could think of uh, some of your, your own particularly fond memories of, of Lana Turner as the mother of Cheryl Crane. You know, some some points in, in time that stand out for you? Well, so many of my memories of her um, consist of my watching her doing things. Um, I used to adore to sit in, she had this beautiful, lavish bathroom, and, and I would sit there and watch her have her hair done up if she's going to a gala or a premiere, or sit and watch her put her makeup on. And she would, as I got older, she'd give me tips on on things, how to do certain things with makeup. And, I mean, Judy Garland, for instance, who lived next door, she I can remember her sitting in the bathroom watching my mother get made up. I mean, it's been just as fascinated. Uh, with her as I was but so there's that memory and then the memories of the times that we were actually uh, together alone when I'm 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 young uh, which were very rare because there was either my Nana or my governess or my grandmother always with me so those moments are our memories of her trying to teach me to to paint um, hmm. it was a very personal thing with her um, she used well now there again I'm skipping around but Frank Sinatra got her started painting he gave her a, a huge uh, gift of oil paint set and my mother painted a lot but she would just stuff them in the closet I mean she never hung them the painting um, really? but it was an outlet for her so I remember that. Um, I remember going horseback riding with her, just the two of us. Now I'm skipping around in ages here. That's fine, uh, absolutely. That were moments that were so important to me that, that stand out in my memory. I was driving in the car with her, and I was always saying, go faster, go faster. She She was a very fast driver and had... Lots of wonderful cars. Um, but just the one-on-one with her, the memories. And that that even up until when she was ill, and I would go see her every day, and we'd sit for an hour or two and just, you know, be together alone. Mm-hmm. She was well, you had, you, had, you had me at uh, 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 Judy, uh, Judy living next door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of all right, I threw that in, but it is true. <laughs> uh, were there um, less pleasant memories? I mean, were there moments that you wish you could erase? I, I, can, I know I'm... That's an interesting uh, question, Bob, because I ha- in, in order to answer it, I have to say truthfully, uh, I wouldn't change anything mm. because I believe personally that... If you change something, then the future changes too. And mm-hmm. I'm very happy with my life and and my future, I hope, but where I am today. And maybe I wouldn't be here and maybe I'd be a different person if I went back and changed anything. So mm-hmm. I I think things happen 
for a reason, and maybe we don't know what those reasons are right away, or maybe we don't ever know, but how we deal with them has to do with the person we become. Mm-hmm. So, no, I, yeah, I mean, I have bad memories of things, but I wouldn't change them. I wouldn't go back and race. You... Uh... You do present the story uh, in the book, and I, so I, because of there, I bring it up. But the the story of your mother's and your own relationship to uh, gangster uh, Johnny Stampanato. Uh, I call you, it the gangster wannabe. The gangster wannabe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do 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 you want to recap? I would, there's going to be people who don't know what we're talking about, and I, I mean, it, it was. Well, it, he was it's a, part of it's part of history. Um, the Los Angeles Times just did a whole uh, seven-part article on the Gangster Squad, where there he was as a bodyguard to Mickey mm. Cohen, who was the person they were after in those days. Um, so this thing pops up every so often out of the blue, as it did with this series that, with the L.A. Times. So it's mm. history. Um, John Stampinato was a wannabe or mini gangster who had a lot of bad friends. Um, He was introduced to my mother under a different name, under the name John Steele. He whined and dined her. She was single at the time, had just come out of a very bad relationship with Lex Barker, which is another story. And she fell for him. Uh, but she knew he had a... He, she was finally informed who he really was, and he had a bad reputation, so she kind of kept him under wraps. And I didn't really get to know him until maybe six months after they had been seeing each other. Um, anyway, uh, to skip ahead, um, they had an on-again, off-again, very violent relationship uh Scotland Yard threw him out of England when she was there filming a movie because he had beaten her, Um, none of which I knew about. Then um, she went from England to Mexico when they finished the film and she was vacationing. Anyway, he showed up there and they got back together. And she became nominated for Peyton Place, her role in Peyton Place, an Academy Award nomination. And when she returned from Mexico, we picked her up at, we, my grandmother and I, picked her up at the airport. And she and John flew back together. Um, These are all famous photographs around the world. And she told him that she wasn't taking him to the Academy Award. She was taking her mother and her daughter, which she did. Um, Within the next week and a half of time, they had huge arguments and he beat her very badly and she came to me and told finally told me the whole story and I kept saying you know call the police and she said I can't the publicity and in those days that was everybody's fear because every mm-hmm. every movie star had a morals clause in their contract to try and explain to today's audience uh, where the studio could throw you out if you did something that was they considered morally wrong and seeing a gangster was certainly fell into that <laughs> uh, criteria so she was terrified of the publicity there had already been whispers that they were an item and um, uh, so it, uh, leading up to Good Friday I was home from school and staying at my mother's a rented house she had just moved back to L.A. And Beverly Hills, and um, he had been threatening her and threatening me, verbally threatening her and me and my grandmother. Um, And I was listening to all this going on behind her bedroom door, which was closed. And she had told me earlier that she was going to ask him to leave, and I kept saying, please call somebody, have somebody here, and she wouldn't, and... Anyway, uh, it escalated to the point where I was terrified and I ran downstairs looking for something, anything, protection. 
There was a knife on the kitchen counter. I picked it up, ran back upstairs. It was outside the door, and all of a sudden his the door flew open, and he was in front of me, and he had his arm raised, which looked like he was about to strike her. I did not know until long time later that he was carrying um, hangers with clothes behind his back, you know. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, it, all, it was over in a minute. I, he ran into me, I ran into him. I don't know if he, he was dead. And that's how it happened. So that's sort of the history. And from there, life took a whole detour. <laughs> just yeah. where I got the name for my autobiography because our lives just spun out of control for a while. It was a very different life than either of you planned at that point. Exactly. Uh, very, very different. <laughs> very different. But we survived, and that's the whole point of it all, is survival. Cheryl, how differently do you think society and the judicial system would have handled that same situation today? Would it have been oh, very, different? Oh, very, very different. In fact, there were laws that were changed because of me. I had no representation. Um, I was whisked away to juvenile hall. Uh, there was a coroner's inquest. Many people think there was a trial. There was never a trial. There was a coroner's inquest, um, which is what happens before a district attorney then takes something to trial. The coroner has to say there's a reason for a trial or a reason mm -hmm. for somebody to be charged. Um, in my case, uh, it was ruled justifiable homicide by the coroner's inquest. Uh, but I wasn't there. I wasn't represented. Um, I suddenly became a ward of the court. Um, I, I mean, none of this would happen today. And in those days, once you became a ward of the court, I mean, they had you under their control. Mm -hmm. And until I turned 18... The court had to decide everything that I could do and not do and not do, which actually was a very, very difficult thing for them as well as for me, and, and a very unfair um, situation. But today that, you know, it's, it's a whole new world. A child immediately has a representative that is strictly for them and their benefit. Mm hmm and then they didn't. So, you know, it would be different. Your uh, your mother eventually told you that you saved her life. Did did that help bring the whole trauma and all that lost time it, it into perspective? Did, you have to understand that this was the 50s. And I think with anyone who grew up in the 50s or even whose parents grew up in the 50s can understand that you just, didn't talk about certain things. You know, there's, we used to say there is not an elephant sitting on my foot. You know, it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. But that elephant is there in the middle of the room. And you walk around it, you can't walk through it. And that's how we were. We did not discuss anything unpleasant. And you were supposed to pretend it never happened. It never, you know, my grandmother used to drive me crazy because she was the, the author of all of this. I mean, she brought my, my mother up. She trained my mother that way. My mother trained and grandmother trained me that way. You know, you don't talk about money. You don't talk about religion. You don't talk about politics. And you certainly do not discuss anything that could cause uh, somebody to be uncomfortable or to cry or any of that, to be emotional. You know, right. Emotions had to stiff up her lip and all that stuff, you know. Very Southern. Very, I come from Southern stock, so you have to understand that, that it's the genteel way of acting. So it wasn't until I was an adult when we had that conversation, my mother and I, and her, her, she said to me, you mean, my God, you mean I never thanked you for that? Yeah. And that, I mean, that was like, that that was like being hugged by 
the greatest hug in the world. I mean, it's, yes, it meant so much to me. I wish it had happened when I was 14, but at least it happened. And that's the right. Point. Were there were there any stories that you hesitated to tell in the book that uh, you held back on? I tried to tell every story that I could remember. Some were more difficult than others, um, but they all form the pattern of who we are. So, mm. you know. It, Everything had to be there or it wouldn't be a complete story. And I, I, I can't think of anything that was left out except photographs. <laughs> it just <didn't. laughs> Did um, you, you write in the book about uh, when your mother wrote her autobiography, and of course you wrote yours, uh, did anything in her book surprise you at the time? Uh, yes. The things that were left out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, truly. You know, I mean, I have to explain, uh, if you don't mind me taking the time sure. to explain, but my mother backed into her autobiography. It was a book in process being written by Hollis Alpert, uh, who wrote a lot of books on stars. And she was not planning on doing a book at all, ever. Because we had discussed, you know, would you ever write a book? Because books were starting to come out. Now everybody's writing books. There's a new right. one every day. Uh, never, never, never. Um, she was very private. So Fred May, her one of her husbands and dear friends, uh, had talked with Hollis, and, and he said, you really should talk to this man. He's wonderful. He, he's crazy about you. He's writing a, a wonderful story. I think you, well, anyway, so my mother did meet with him, and they talked, and they liked each other, and all of a sudden, mother said, you know, I'm writing this book with you, but I, I'm not getting any credit, and he said, well, would you, you know, consider, <laughs> and she said, well, I might, and, of course, the publisher, you know, which was William Morrow, just absolutely fell over themselves that they were going to get, well, poor Hollis ended up without even a credit on it, uh. and... um you know, it, it got published, but it was it, there was a lot of honesty in it, but there was a lot left out. And at that time, I was living in Hawaii, and when she gave me her book, or even told me she was doing it, which was a shock, um, and I asked her, I said, well, are you going to address certain you know, things in, that were happening? Um, and she said, oh, no, I would never do that. You know, and I said, "Well, why write the book?" You know, <laughs> rather, oh, I would never do that. So I wrote my own book, and I did address them. And, and I know you're going to say what, and I'm talking about Lex Barker and, and the fact that he raped me when I was ten. So that, you know, so there were things that definitely I can understand her not putting them in there. You know, this was the early '80s; it was a little different world. But I, mm-hmm. I had trouble with the fact she left some things out so that in honesty is is was my opinion there it was a good read it certainly Mm -hmm. you know it was an interesting book and there was a lot of truth in it so i'm not taking away from that but i didn't think that it really presented the woman i knew Mm -hmm. you know it presented the movie star which was fine but she was so much more than that now, in, in 88, of course, you published uh, Detour and told a little more uh, of her story and a lot of your story. Yes, uh, did, but that did she, was uh, story. You know, that, yeah. that was the difference. How did she respond to your story? I sent her the galleys. I was living in San Francisco. She was in Los Angeles. And I sent her the galleys and... She read them. I wasn't there when she was reading them. She called me on the phone, and she said, well, I just finished. And there was this deep sigh. She said, I want you to know I think you're one hell of a woman, and I'm very proud of you. Now, I know later, because we had just, we discussed it later on, we're talking now, 
in the last couple of years of her life, that mm-hmm. she was absolutely devastated by it. She learned so many things that she did not know that it happened to me mm-hmm. by reading the book, which is a hell of a way for a mother to learn things about their daughter, you know. Um, as close as we had become and as many things as we had discussed, because during the writing of Detour, I would check with her on things because I knew, I, I mean, that she said, get it right, you know. Yeah. So uh, I would, but there were many things I didn't tell her about because she wasn't there that I happened to me, you know, that I put in the book. Um, she kind of went into seclusion for a couple of years, uh, I think she was probably feeling or wondering how people were looking at her, and yet there was nothing that she did that anyone should judge her for, as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned. Uh, but I think she felt some some guilt and some sorrow, um, as we all do, you know, when bad things happen and you wonder if you could have changed some of what you could have done different so they didn't happen. You know, I mean, that's human nature. But she right. came out of it and and emerged from her ivory tower and to the point where she was back out on the town every night <laughs> <laughs> to tease her and we'd be with her. So we had a lot of fun. That was, But that jumps to the, you know, early 90s. Not so right. far to starting in ninety probably, when I moved back to L.A. Then we couldn't keep her home. <laughs> right, and you, you talked about that in the book, that she had that last spurt of just wanting yeah. to be out all the time, doing things. Yeah. Uh, Didn't want to miss that. that thing. Yeah. Well, uh, we've come, uh, I just looked up and saw the time, we've actually come to the end of the hour. I, I just wanted to know. Oh, my know God, it. it went so fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a um, compliment. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm glad. I, I enjoyed uh, talking to you. I was, I've been looking forward to it, uh, and it, it, uh, you did not disappoint. You're a good storyteller, and uh, it's a fine book. I'm just wondering, uh, now that the book is out, what, uh, what's next for you? What are you, what are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm still doing some book signings. I'm still doing some interview, you know, radio stuff. And this, you're my first, I guess, blog. Or you, you are a blog, <laughs> right? Um, blog, podcast, yeah. Yeah, podcast, sorry. I have to get it right. You know, I'm I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as tech savvy as I should be, but I'm at least you know I do own two computers, so I'm not <laughs> totally out of it. But and I love email. But what's next? I'm in real estate. Uh, hmm. Not the greatest field right now, but I've been in it since '79, so I've ridden a lot of these waves. Uh, and I've I've got a couple of projects up my sleeve that are. Right now, um, I can't really talk about it, but they're going to be exciting, and you'll know about them. Okay, good, good. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> well, maybe, folks, uh, maybe we'll be able to chat again. I would, I would, I would like that, and please keep me in mind because uh, this was a lot of fun. Um, I want to tell people they can find uh, Cheryl Crane's new photo book, uh, Lana: The Memories, the Myths, the Movies, at your local bookstore, or you can order it online at Amazon.com or MRMedia.com for MrMedia.com. Um, Cheryl, uh, what can I say? Thank you so much for joining us. It was a, it was well, a great hour. Thank you, thank you, and I've enjoyed it. It's a nice trip down memory lane. Oh, thank you. Well, best of luck to you, and I hope we'll get to talk again. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. And, folks, for uh, dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, you can uh, surf over to our uh, main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with movie stars such as Kirk Douglas and Billy Bob Thornton. Please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, DigitalJournal.com, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, MediaFly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Audio, Kindle, the Kindle Reader, or iTunes. And if you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at Bob at Andelman, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you... Uh, Give up a little time from your day and spend it with us. Come back soon, everybody.